an ancient land to me. And when the morning sun reveals the hills and plains, I can see a land where children can run free. a song that Sir Lyndon and others took with them on their journey throughout this country when they were preaching for equal opportunity and they were asking the nation to see us with racial equality and social upliftment that was the song that was a theme song because it spoke to what they would do fight or die fighting because the message was very clear. The nation needed the leaders at the time. And I look at Leo because when I was a little boy, just coming out from school very young, and I got into ZNS early because at the time we just could not afford college. And so I wanted to be a broadcaster. And I began dreaming when I was 10 years old that I could be that thing. I asked my father for a tape recorder, and I took the tape recorder every weekend, and I just read from the newspaper. I had my own show <laughs> on the tape recorder. And then when I spent time with John Martin, 
my good friend who's now passed, who was like a father and later became a brother. His wife found the tape recorder one day and asked what was this and put it on, so I was very embarrassed. But I wanted to be a broadcaster, and so I had no difficulty dreaming. And when I came home from school, I had an opportunity to sneak into nightclubs, and I heard Leo. And I thought he was one of the more brilliant entertainers that I've ever That's seen. Right. In my life. And what was so amazing, young people, uh, is this, that even at my young age, and he was more senior than me, he made me go home. <laughs> After a particular time, they would say, it's time for y'all young boys to go home. Guiding and leading. So, Leo, I thank you. Thank you. Lesson, we're here today to, to listen to you sing that song, trust me. Trust me, he'd be so appreciative. I've come tonight to share a few words with you, to speak to you about a man who I got to know so very well. Many would not know that when he came to Grand Bahama and he came here to set up and to be a part of the Progressive Liberal Party, that he was close with my father and many others. But I didn't know him. In fact, I remember when I was a little boy and listening to the political discussions in our household and could not believe how boring this subject was. <laughs> what could these men possibly be doing talking one subject all day? <laughs> Look what I'm doing today. <laughs> but here it was. They were thinking about Freeport, and I'll talk about Freeport because in the scheme of things, in our global development, You'd understand why Freeport was so peculiar at the particular time of the revolution. But Sir Lyndon was a very interesting figure because no one was more humble than he was, no one more brilliant than I've been around, and no one with a greater vision. In fact, I would argue that Sir Lyndon was one of the greatest men of the 20th century. Not only for the Bahamas, not only for the Caribbean, but for the global community. Because something he did right in our country impacted the world and still today is impacting the world. Today is an important day to speak about this great man because today is also the birthday of his lovely wife. And so I'm sure she's very pleased that young people, men and women of the Bahamas, are remembering her husband. When Sir Lyndon came home in 1953, and when he was being called to the Bahamas bar, when he gave his speech, he made it known that whilst I'm called to cause for the doctrine of equity to reign supreme in the judicial prudence, one thing that I must know is that I have a feeling in my soul that I am called upon to serve even outside these buildings and these walls of justice. He knew and he told his class at the time that he was going to serve the people of the Bahamas. And he said, I don't know how, but I shall. And so when he was elected, in 1956, July 9th, and I wish you to pay attention to the dates because you begin to see how the dates of this great man all come together. You would begin to understand why when he read Deuteronomy, when he talked about the 40th year and the fact that in the 40th year you can go and claim your land, go <coughs> claim what you've worked so hard for, come from the sides of the mountain and go out and possess your land, then you would understand why there's a July 10th. And if you check your Bible, particularly Leviticus 23 and 27, you'd see it says that on the 10th day of the seventh month should be the Day of Atonement. 
many don't understand how deep Salinden was in the biblical world. Many would never understand how he understood that he was a child of God. Many would not understand or even appreciate that when he stood with certain churches, he was ensuring that the church received the liberty that they must have in our society. But many do know now that he was born and christened and taught in the Seventh-day Adventist church. But he told me once, he said, whilst he knew it was his church and it gave him his discipline, it caused him to see the world the way he did. He said he understood the difficulty he faced in our Bahamas because he said people laughed at the Jumper Church. And so he went to the Jumper Church to give it legitimacy. That's why every year you would see him at the conventions and I couldn't figure it out until one day I asked him, why do you come? He said, I go because the church would not have been the church. And if you understand the history of our country and you appreciate that there was a time when Bahamians and the slaves had no freedom. And so they went to church, they went to Meeting Street. And it's in Meeting Street where they found refuge and where they found a place for the celebration and to plan their future. So everything Sir Lyndon did, I later discovered in my life, was purposefully driven. He knew why and he planned it all. He understood what he was called to do. And in 1956, when he was elected, he came to Parliament with some individuals who he said was then the first step of the journey. The first step of the journey. Many would not understand because you still had an opposition, but it was the first step of the journey. You weren't government. You didn't have the power. But here he was now in a position in the Parliament of the Bahamas and beginning to argue against the things that existed in our country. There was plural voting. You could not vote if you had no land. Women could not vote. And if you did have land, you could vote multiple times. In fact, you manipulated the process because there were more seats in the family islands than there were seats in the capital city. And he had to fight for it. Just imagine, you young people today who are in school, just imagine that when they took examinations for children to enter school, there was something called the reading examination. And when they took that examination in 1963, he told me, he said, 14 of 500 students of the Family Islands passed. It wasn't easy to get into government high school either, although it was the special school. But you had to have a little bit to get in. And so just imagine where we were. Trade unions did not have the right to be a part of a body. When you hear the unions today, the Trade Union Congress, no, there were 17 unions in our country at the time. But they couldn't be a part of a single body. And the reason is very simple because the parliamentarians at the time were parliamentarians who were part of the oligarchy. They were part of not the UBP yet, although it would become the UBP, but they controlled the mercantile class of our country, and they controlled the parliament. And so could you imagine them allowing for you to be a part of a union to fight against who? To fight against them. So they were not allowed to. They could form themselves into a union, but that was it, a single body. They could not become a part of an umbrella organization. And so you would understand that the fight was this liberty that they searched for. They could not have the liberty otherwise. And so when they began this surge and this effort, it was intended to cause for the liberty. And women didn't have the right to vote. You look at women in our country today, look at where, I saw the young lady just read and she said she wants to be a doctor. What could you imagine? If you want to be a lawyer, could you imagine? Even the preacher woman couldn't have it. Could you imagine now when you hear all the dreams of our people, you then begin to appreciate where we've come from. 
that was just a dream in some, but it could not happen. Now you can say strongly and proudly, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. But women couldn't vote. And when Dame Doris Johnson had the opportunity in 1960, because Sir Lyndon arranged for her to address Parliament, she could not do so in Parliament. They had to arrange for her to do so in the magistrate's court. And so they allowed it. And it was there where she called for the freedom and the liberty. It was there where she began the arguments, the public arguments, and, and you would see throughout the history of the Progressive Liberal Party, women were always playing a major role. And then women voted for the first time in 1962. So Lyndon said that that was then the third most important thing to happen in his quest to cause for the change. The second happened to be when there was an election in 1960 and some other of his men were elected, including Arthur Hanna. As he began to think about what was required to change things in our country, so Lyndon went to the Colonization Commission conference it was held at the United Nations. And at that conference in 1964, he presented the argument, and what's so interesting about that, look at who represented the country at the time. You had the church that was represented by H.W. Brown. You also had Arthur Folks who was there. You had men and women, one. Her name was Dame Doris Johnson. She was there. And they went there to tell the United Nations, we needed your help. They told them about education. They told them about health care. They told them about the labor situations. They told them that the liberty must begin and that we needed to have our people free, free to be whatever they wanted to be, to stand for whatever they wanted to stand for. And so, an entire campaign began, and Sir Lyndon pointed out, he said, the only reason, the only reason we are standing with you today is because when several months before, we had a situation where our people stood up and we caused for the liberation to begin. He was talking about the general strike. He was talking about efforts that were being made by others to cause for this freedom. And so, when you consider that Sir Lyndon Penling always had the opportunity to change, the first thing he did was ensure that the people were part of what he was doing. 1965, when the whole question of Black Tuesday arose, what people don't know is that one of the greatest men around at the time was the Cecil Wallace Whitfield. What people still don't know is how close he and Sir Lyndon were. In fact, I would tell you that I was with Sir Lyndon in Barbados at an IDB conference when Sir Lyndon received a telephone call. And he left the session to go to a room to take the call. And then he retreated to his room. And then later told us, because we didn't know what happened, we just know that he went into a quiet mood. He later told us that Sir Cecil been diagnosed with cancer. That was the first time that I saw this man, who I thought was his enemy in politics, show his emotion for what I later discovered was his friend. Because they had gone through the struggles together, they had been through the trenches, they had fought for the freedom. And so Black Tuesday must never be dismissed one of the more important days because it was planned. And don't forget there were some casualties from the PLP because some of the PLP members did not agree with it. And that's how come some went and formed their own party and never came back. Some did, some never came back. But what Sir Lyndon did was he, Sir Cecil, and some of the women planned this wonderful event as history would show. And then on that day when it came, so Lyndon told me, and if you read the articles written and an interview he did just before his passing, he said that he was standing in the chamber about to do what he promised to do, take the mace and throw it out, but he said he got a bit frightened. He said he got a little scared. He said Cecil ran upstairs and 
So Cecil said, throw it out. And he said he looked at Cecil and kept on talking with something else. So Cecil went back down and another 10 minutes, Cecil was back up. And he said, and he could see what he was saying, they weren't kind words. <laughs> and so he said he just panicked and he did what he had to do. He said, but he was frightened. He was frightened because, firstly, it would be a giant step. But more importantly, there were people standing in Rawson Square. And he wasn't sure what would happen to the people. He wasn't sure that if the riot act was read and it was, what would happen? How would you keep the people calm? What Sir Lyndon said eventually happened is, after they did what they had to do, they went downstairs quickly. And they told the people just to be quiet, just to be relaxed, just to sit. Don't do anything. And then they retreated to one of the grounds where he had speeches and then the people went home. Because he was concerned about what the reaction would be. He did not want any of those persons who took a position to find themselves behind bars or hurt. And we must remember, just across the street in the United States of America, they were going through their civil rights movement as well. And we were seeing the opposite. So we were also learning from what was going on there. So Sir Lyndon said that that became a crowning moment. But still, how do you get the message out to the people? How do you cause the people to understand what is happening? When you see Sir Arthur Folks today, and although he would eventually become a part of the FNM, but now serve as Governor General away from the political fray. The truth is he was a major player in the Progressive Liberal Party in the movement for the liberation. And what many don't remember is that there was a paper called the Bahamian Times because the Guardian was in fact created to be the UBP voice piece and the Tribune, although you had the publisher who had called for the freedom of the people, the truth is you did not have a voice. And so the Bahamian Times was created, and here in Grand Bahama, in Abaco, in Andrus, all over this country, women were raising money. They were raising money to keep the paper going. But the paper became, because we didn't have the internet then, so you needed to get the message out. And if you look at some of the papers from the past, you'd see it was all about the future. The future, what would the future be? The future would be education. The future would be healthcare. The future would be causing for Bahamians to have a right, the future would be entrepreneurial opportunities, what the future held. But how did you get the people to vote? Because remember when the women voted for the first time in 1962, the PLP still lost. Although the PLP pulled 32,000 votes, the FNM or the UBP at the time pulled 28,000 votes. So you figure, well, what happened? If you got the popular vote, why did you lose? You lost because you didn't have the seats. Because the seats were so poorly distributed. And that is what they were fighting for. They were fighting for even distribution of the seats. And so eventually it began to happen because of the pressure put by the people, the movement by the people. So Lyndon said, I was in front of the movement, but it was the people. And always remember this, and people tend to forget this. I don't think history records it correctly, in my view. Because if you look at it, the history would show that the PLP never lost the election. It won the popular vote. It lost the seats. And so when you think about the movement that started in 53, a movement, and we must remember this as well, and I don't think that we always do, because when we talk about the Progressive Liberal Party being the party that Sir Lyndon led, we forgot or forget that the party was led by white men. It wasn't formed by black men. It was formed by three white men. Three white men, H.M. Taylor being one, William Cartwright being the other, and another gentleman who just passed. We have had all these individuals in our history, and the truth is, these individuals were the ones who were out front. But because they saw what the black man saw as well, the truth was it was all the oligarchy that was running the country, that had the power, 
And if you didn't have means, you had nothing. And you didn't have opportunity. So they were fighting against the same thing. But when H.M. Taylor lost his bid to, in the House of Assembly, so then, then when he emerged as leader of the Progressive Liberal Party, and then the party began to move in a different direction. But all throughout history, and our contemporary history, no one talks about the fight of the white man and the Progressive Liberal Party. They tend to forget that important part of history. Because when that party was formed, so Lyndon and those were just coming home. They weren't even around at the time, but they came at the right time. And when they came, they were able to take leadership of the organization and move with it. And so when 1967 came about, we must remember now that Sir Lyndon, who represented a seat in Nassau, made the strong position that to win, we have to go win some of the islands. And so he switched, and he went to South Andros. Now, could you imagine moving out of the capital city to run in South Andros? And he was running against Cyril Stevenson. Now, who was he? He was a third member of those who founded the PLP but he was now running as an independent. And so Linda was running against him. And on the night of the election in 1967, you must remember this as well, that when the votes were coming in, the last place to give its results was South Andros. And so Linda barely won that seat. Barely won that seat. Subsequently, in every election after that, well, <laughs> you get beat by 90% of the votes. But on that first occasion, it was just that close. But here he was in a very peculiar situation, not only for election night, but even before election night, because Sir Lyndon was in London. And then there was this question of whether or not on nomination they would he be back in time to nominate. But guess who had the papers ready for him? Sir Cecil Wells Whitfield, because he was chairman of the PLP at the time. And he had the papers ready in the event, so Lyndon didn't make it back. He and Lady Penley would be there to cause for the domination of Sir Lyndon Penley. But he made it back and everything went as smoothly as was expected. But then Sir Lyndon went on and he won the seat. And then it was tied. 1919, could you believe that? 1919. But then, Sir Lyndon, who had begun a movement with labor. Randall Fox, and if you remember just several months ago, the government chose to name Labor Day after Sir Randall. And Sir Randall, who in fact calls for Labor Day in the first instance, but now it's named in his honor. But you must remember that he was one of the six elected in 1956. And his, at the time, was a member of the Progressive Liberal Party. But then he always claimed that he had the Labor Party. And so when a second election came up, he did not run with the Progressive Liberal Party. And so he was more on the outside. But on the night of the victory for the people, 1967, and the negotiations began, Sir Lyndon made a call to Sir Randall. And they discussed him joining and becoming a member of the cabinet which he agreed. And then when the FNM called, or the UVP called at the time, he told them he had and would not be a part of their movement. And then there was Alfred Brennan. Alfred Brennan was a white baby, but an independent he was, very strong man <coughs> who always had his own views and very strong views, and he also agreed to join. He would eventually become the speaker, and the PLP would have the majority. The government was formed, so then independently became the first black premier of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, and eventually will go on to become the prime minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. But it was a victory, but only the first step. Because, as you noted, we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of independence. This happened before independence. This was a journey toward independence. And that is why I think the intellectual debate is still out. What was more important? 1967 or 1973, and would you argue, would you have 1973 without 1967? 
And it is a debate because it was, in fact, the UBP who had said in the early 60s that we must move toward independence, except when you got closer to it, they said, ain't nothing happening. <laughs> but the truth is, they had also <coughs> talked about it. So what came first? And so Sir Lyndon's issue was he had a minority government and he had the powerful UBP to contend with. Because, as I said, when they needed to publish a newspaper, they needed people to raise money to publish the newspaper. So that tells you how, how poor we were. And then you had all of the oligarchy, all of the UBP, all those persons with all the money. Every single one of them, the leader of the country at the time was, well, before that, Sir Randall, Sir, Sir Roland Simonet. And Sir Roland Simonet was a road builder, just like his son is today. But he made lots of money being a road builder, tons of money being a road builder. And so you have to appreciate that you saw something coming where Sir Lyndon had to play some very good politics. And that is why when people talk about the death of a member of parliament in 1968 who was struck by a vehicle and eventually you had to have a, another election, you could have a by-election. So Lyndon, who had built the popularity, decided to go for a general election. The general election to cause a separation. Because could you imagine trying to govern with a one-seat majority? And at the time when we had issues still in this country because you still had People all over the Bahamas still not comfortable with a black government. You had investors who were leaving the country because of a black government. You had black Bahamians right here in Grand Bahama, which led to the Lewis Yard incident, who did not have the comfortability and who thought that we should have a change. And then you had a movement and a surge of interest for leadership within the Progressive Liberal Party. So Sir Lyndon had to play the political game and had to be very smart with it. And so he called the general election, and he won the general election, and he won handsomely, which began the Progressive Liberal Party's strength, which gave him then the courage to talk about the independence. Because what people don't remember is that the first call for independence actually came from within his party. It was Randall Fox and uh, A.D. Hanna and others were talking about it long periods of time. And so when you see what eventually happened, and they made the move toward independence, and they began to produce the papers for discussion throughout the country to cause all Bahamians to have an appreciation as to where we're going, that's when this whole thing about what we're going to do. And he already began doing it. Because people, again, won't remember that after the PLP won in 1967, the first thing you had to do was educate the Bahamian people. The civil service was all members from the British government. They were all members of the colony. And so they, we had to think about how we're going to educate Bahamians. Then you had to get some teachers. Then you had to get some doctors. You had to get and begin to educate our people to take over the government. And so the question would be, could they do it the next day, or the next two days, or the next two years? That is why when people I think as a nation, we don't understand that we're just coming into our own right now. Because it takes you a while to cause for that educational process to truly mean what it should mean and also to understand the running of governance. We were a country that just came from being a colony. We were a country with little or no means. We were a country that said we could do some things. So Lyndon, when he won in 1967, the first interview, he told the white Bahamian to just look, just look at our country. He told them that I have no difficulty. We have no difficulty. Our umbrella is big. We want all of you to be a part of this country. We want all of you to get under the umbrella and let's work together. I spoke with Norman Solomon before he passed. Because I remember Norman Solomon in a radio interview in 1992, where Norman Solomon made a statement. He said, he said, Sir Lyndon Pending could have destroyed the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. He said, if Sir Lyndon had decided that he was going to push out the white Bahamian, just imagine what would have happened. But how could he? It was the white Bahamian who had the economy. 
And if you decided to push them out, then you had no economy. So he had to take the decision that I'm going to work and allow them to continue to hold on to the economy. That is why when you look at our country still today, there are many white Bahamians who are still dominating the economy. Well, that's a part of the expectation. Because as Pindlin said, and she read one of the quotes earlier, Selinden also talked about one day causing for economic independence. But he said, to achieve it, you must do it in stages. That's where we're headed now. In fact, I believe that is what the 40th anniversary this year should introduce. It should introduce our movement toward economic independence. That's what we should be working on in stages. What are the stages? The stages must be first and foremost education. Education. You must have exposure. You must have knowledge. And when we talk about economic empowerment, we're talking about owning our economy. Look at what we're faced with today in our country, where you are constantly having to talk with the foreign investor to what? Own the hotels. Which Bahamian owns one of the major hotels? And why should we own what is our economy? When you think about the cruise ships, why is it that we're still there? Oh, we're there because we ain't there yet. So when we think about economic empowerment, you've got to own your economy, because then you determine your destiny. The problem we have now is we're still being controlled to some degree. And we're still dependent upon what happens everywhere else, except what happens at home. We haven't yet looked at what Selinden said would happen. He said self-sustainability begins when we understand the family islands. In 1989, for instance, Lyndon said, we're going to begin the electrification of the family islands. Why? Because if you cause for development and investment, it must ensure that we have the infrastructure in place. You must have electricity. You must have telephones. You must have all the requirements. That's why that began in 1989. It's now completed throughout the country. One or two areas still don't have some running water, but generally it's completed. And so therefore, when you hear the present Prime Minister, Perry Christie, talk about the agricultural school in Andros and causing for distribution, you started up with several million and 10 years down the road, you're talking 90 million. How can you do that today? You can do that today because the ground has been laid. That's the whole purpose and the whole process. If you can't and if you don't understand that there were building blocks, that's why when you say the shoulders we stand on, absolutely. We're still standing on them. And But we have to understand as political leaders that we are not controlling the destiny unless we understand the history. Too often we have political offices and we believe it's about the power. No, sir. It's about continuing the course. So Lyndon always told me, he said, Obi, if you don't have a cause, what are you fighting for? <laughs> what are you fighting for? If young men and young women don't have a cause, what's going on in your life? She has a cause, she wants to be a doctor. She has a cause, she wants to be a lawyer. She has a cause, she wants to be a teacher. That's a cause. You're fighting toward a cause. If you don't give people a cause, when I don't have one, I create one. Because it is always about where we're we going. Where are we going? If we don't get there, it's because as a nation, we're not motivating our people to do so. Every political convention I went to when Sir Lyndon Penning was leader, I always walked away knowing that Sir Lyndon, he just inspired me again. That's what he did. He inspired you every day. In other words, don't drop. Keep on going. Keep on trucking. We're going to get there. When we decided as a country that we needed schools, is because we had none. And so public education became so important. Because you can't have a country if you don't have people. You can't have a great country unless you have great citizens. And greatness is not the wealth you have. Greatness is not how much houses you own or how many cars you have. Greatness is what lives in your soul your ability to reach out and touch others, 
to inspire people to want to be better than they were yesterday. That's what Sir Lyndon did. If you spend a moment with him, I remember the first time I was with him one night and he came to me the next day and he said, I forgot to give you something last night. I said, what is that? He said, I bought a book for you. I said, okay. He gave me a book on Malcolm X. I said, okay, wonderful, thick book. Well, two weeks later he said, what about the symbolisms of that book? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> there it was. And so, you know, I had to dance around that answer. <laughs> I had read it, but I didn't understand his question. But here it was, it was teaching. He began the process of teaching to someone who he thought would have a role to play. In fact, what was very interesting, when I was still a reporter, I was in the current island with him, and he was talking about a function, he was at, speaking at a function, and there were other ministers there. And then he said, there's a young man in the back there by the name of Obi Wilson. He said, he's not a politician, but one day he will be. He said, because he has a head, he has a heart, he has a stomach. I was just a reporter. But if you listen to others like James Moultrie, you'd recognize that he called James Moultrie and told James Moultrie, I want you to go to school. If you listen to the story of Perry Christie, when he saw Perry Christie in London, he later called him and said, I want you to come and be a senator. When you realize that he always sought out people, look at Picewell Forbes. Picewell Forbes, who was a student in Andros, at the Andros High School. He was graduating, already passed the examinations to become a police. And so then spoke at the graduation, said, one day one of you in here would replace me in Parliament. He got Picewell a job at ZNS, and I was still, I was at ZNS at the time. Picewell came in and went to the College of the Bahamas. Now Picewell has associates, he has bachelors, he has masters, sits in the parliament, he's now a representative of the Bahamas in the foreign ministry. In fact, nowadays you must call him Your Excellency. Yes. <laughs> so it just tells you. But he saw him and he said, you're going to be this thing. And when you look at the history, it is true. Picewell did replace Sir Linden because an f and M won, then an independent won. Now, the first PLP to win after Sir Linden was Pricewell Forbes. As I said, he always had a notion and a view and saw how he could make it work. Look at the women of this country. Many people don't appreciate that in 1962 when women voted for the first time what began. And look what he did. He took a woman. Margaret MacDonald, and he made Margaret MacDonald the first woman to ever serve as the cabinet secretary. In other words, at the highest single position in the public service. He had lifted women and lifted her as a symbol for what women could eventually become. That is why I think I'd like to see more of our history being taught, but in a way where we'd understand what they were seeking to do. Look at the athletes. Look at how we win gold medals now. But what people forget is when Sir Lyndon decided that he was going to take Pauline Davis, Bradley Cooper, Frank Weatherford, and he made them elite athletes. And he hired them to work in the Ministry of Tourism and put them abroad. Why? So that they wouldn't have to go to work, but they could earn some money whilst they're training for track and field. And when Frank Weatherford won a medal in 1992 in the triple jump in bronze, I was with Sir Lyndon, and I remember him touching me on my back and said, well done. And guess what happened afterwards? When the government changed in 1992, they all got fired because they didn't understand what was being done. There was no way else you could afford to pay them without violating their amateur status. And you had to find a way to ensure that they could exist. And so he was beginning to lay the ground for what now we celebrate. Look at what we're celebrating. In the 40 years, could you imagine this little country? 300,000 people, a couple of tracks, good tracks. Just got a real stadium recently. And we're producing Olympians? Just imagine what was happening. If we understand 
what they were seeking to do, what he was seeking to do, you'd understand how he formed his government. I believe that the slowest period that we've ever seen in the history of the Bahamas was from 2008 to the present time. We saw the economy crumble. Now, I'm not a negative person. I operate on a simple premise. The glass is always half full. And I look at things differently than most people. Because once that happened, I said, now we're going to see the brilliance of national insurance. And as I expected, we turned to national insurance and all that Sir Lyndon said in his speeches, that national insurance would eventually be the safety net and it would also provide eventually that structure that would allow for those persons who lose employment to be able to receive payments for their contributions. Again, a significant thing that he did. And suppose we didn't have it. And we must remember history would show that some people didn't support it. But Sir Lyndon wanted to do it. In fact, you ask him, you said, what's your greatest accomplishment? He says, national insurance. National insurance national insurance because of it providing for, he said, young people who become old people dignity in their elderly years and also the safety net that would be required. That's why we have national insurance. And look how many people benefiting from it today. And also it was created to help us build what? Clinics, health care. They put a fund in there to ensure that we can because we didn't have the clinics all over this country. All a part of a plan that made sense. So when people talk about national insurance and when you think about national insurance, you should think about what it was intended to do and why it's important for us. And even in his speeches, Sir Lyndon said, listen, there will be a day we're going to have national health insurance. And I hear the debates all the time about it, but it's going to happen because it must happen. Because still today, Bahamians are dying because they don't have the wherewithal. They don't have the money. They don't have the ability to get to a doctor to get the treatment. So it has to happen. When Bahamas Air was opened, Sir Lyndon said, 1974, Sir Lyndon said, Bahamas Air will serve as a communication link to link the islands of the Bahamas. But he said 20 years from now, Bahamas Air will step away from this role and become a part of the economic development of the Bahamas because by that time, other Bahamians would have invested in the airline industry and they'll have Bahamian pilots flying their own planes. Isn't that where we are right now? It was intended to bring us together as a people because you have the family islands. And he knew then that many were leaving the islands to come to work in Nassau because of economic opportunity. But how do you get home? So you have to find a way. Some people still take the mail boat. But you have to find a way to do it. And so Bahamas Air came. Now we're talking today, and I'm Minister of Tourism, I can tell you, today we're talking about Bahamas Air becoming that important vehicle that I need in tourism so I can get my numbers back to Next year, I need 400,000 more visitors coming to the Bahamas. And I can't do it unless I have a friendly carrier. Who's that? Bahamas Air. So we are right where he said we would be. We are right where he knew we would be. When people talk about education, we don't understand that it was Lyndon as a member of the CARICOM community. CARICOM formed 40 years ago this year, Treaty of Chagaramas in Trinidad. And when they formed the Treaty of Chagaramas, among the things they discussed was the university, West Indies, and regional involvement. And throughout the years, the Bahamas has been a major contributor to it. And so when you saw the College of the Bahamas evolve, he knew that we had to cause for our own Bahamians to have the education and the rise of the levels, to make sure that we could stand with brothers and sisters all over. 
because when the Karakoram community was founded, it was always intended that the community would be together because we're stronger 5 million people than we are 300,000 people, particularly when you're facing issues before the United Nations and elsewhere. And so he pushed, and he was always a featured speaker whenever I attended conferences with him. And I've been to many in St. Lucia and Guyana and Jamaica and Barbados, all over the Caribbean with some Island. And I saw his counsel when he sat with Forbes Burnham and he sat with Errol Barrow, all the great leaders of the Caribbean because he was one of those persons who thought beyond where he was. He became then a regional leader, a regional leader of tremendous magnitude. And then people should remember this, and particularly now, because I believe you're gonna hear a lot about it over the next couple of days. Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela is in critical condition. When the Bahamas hosted, in 1985, the CARICOM Heads of Government, it was soon after followed by the Commonwealth Heads of Government. Commonwealth leaders came from around the world, 50, to be in the Bahamas. And here in the Bahamas, Sir Lyndon became chairman. And on that occasion, he pushed for, on the agenda, the Nassau Accord. The Nassau Accord was signed in Lyford Key, and so Lyndon became the leader of the Commonwealth to cause for sanctions against South Africa. Why? To free Nelson Mandela. So Lyndon Pinling was able to cause for an eminent persons group to be led by Dame Nita Barrow to do an investigative piece in South Africa to see the conditions of the people and come back and report, because Great Britain was among the countries refusing to sign the Nassau Accord and agree to it. And so she went, she came back, and they met in London, a news conference where they spoke about the deplorable conditions and the fact that apartheid racism was at an all-time high. So Lyndon then went to Chicago to speak to America, and Jesse Jackson invited him and the Rainbow Coalition, he gave a speech entitled, I've Come to Look for America. It was one of the most dramatic and dynamic speeches I've ever heard. In fact, I'll tell you this, last Saturday when I'm sitting down in my house, I'm playing that speech. Because it still inspires me. When he talks about bullet bursting flesh, when he talks about the needs of the people and the freedom of Nelson Mandela. And then there was a conference in Canada where all the leaders came back to discuss putting pressure on Great Britain. So Lyndon was the chairman. And I remember him telling the media, the international media, that now I understand what diplomacy is all about. Because you had leaders from Zimbabwe Leaders from India, Gandhi said, Britain is no longer the leader of the Commonwealth. You had Kaunda who said, we, do no, we will no longer listen to Great Britain. And you had Sir Lyndon who said, we've got to keep the Commonwealth unified. And what happened? The emergence was Britain finally agreed. The Nassau Accord took effect. Sanctions, also the Americans join in. Brian Mulroney, who succeeded Sir Lyndon, wrote a note to Sir Lyndon telling him of his brilliance. Nelson Mandela was freed. Nelson Mandela became a free man because of what took place in our Commonwealth of the Bahamas. And I think that that is so important to world history, so important. And when he was freed, and his first Caribbean stop was Jamaica, and Sir Lyndon went to greet him. I remember it so well because he was greeted at the University of the West Indies, and then they had a celebration at the stadium. And I remember the song where they were singing, Welcome Home, Mr. Mandela, Welcome Home. One of the most significant moments that I've ever been involved in. And he eventually came to the Bahamas. 
and called on Sir Lyndon and his residents to thank him personally. And then, of course, the Honorable Human Ingram posted it. That's history. You can't change that. Brian Mulroney wrote about it. And that's the greatness of our man. He was great for us in building our nation, great for the Caribbean and causing the Caribbean to understand the import of education, the import of infrastructure, the import of understanding that when America came to take and to fight with Grenada and they send in their forces, he told them, listen, you can't do this. When America said they wanted to introduce CBI, so Lyndon told them, you can introduce CBI, but it won't work. Caribbean Basin Initiative because they don't have the infrastructure. He said the places that have the infrastructure, places like Grand Bahama, believe it or not. That's what he said. And he was going against what was a Ronald Reagan plan at the time. Because he was speaking for the Caribbean. And then he became a leader for the world in helping Nelson Mandela become a free man. That's how great this band was. So when we talk about shoulders, how do you think that we have a claim in the world? We have a claim in the world because of the work that Sir Lyndon and his team did. We have a claim in the world because we stood for something. We have a claim in the world because all the things that we did, all the building that we were doing, many perhaps don't understand or see how it all came together, but it has come together and continues to knit our country and make it closer. Look at the political leaders of our country. Look at who trained them all. Arthur Folks, Successor Walls Whitfield, Hubert Alexander Ingram, Perry Gladstone Christie, the present leaders of the country. Think about the impact that this man has had. When we understand what he was seeking to do, we we'll understand how effective he's been. And so, young people, I invite you to study Sir Lyndon Penley. I invite you to, I'm just a privileged one, because the month before he died, he called me to his house. And he could hardly walk at the time, but he's pulling these boxes. And he said to me, um, these are my speeches. And I said, well, what are you doing with them? He said, I'm giving them to you. And he gave me every one. And I cherished them. I read them still to this day. I refer to them still to this day. And I can tell you what's important about it. A couple of weeks ago, I was planning Goombe. And I was just going through the speeches because I didn't know there was a speech on Goombe. And uh, I discovered a speech that he gave about Goombe, but it was 1973, prior to independence. Mm. I didn't know that. And I said, well, hold on now. Goombe was before independence. And he gave a national broadcast on it. Because at the time, he said, it was our very first opportunity to show the world our culture. A folklore festival where the world would see who and what we are. And the interfacing with our visitors, the import of talking to the visitors and showing the visitors what we're all about. That's why even us in ministries who stage events must know there must be a cause. There must be a purpose. That's what he sought to do. And finally here in Freeport, we must remember that when Sir Lyndon came with the bend or break speech, he came because he said, and it was at the opening of Borco, he said because Freeport didn't have a soul. He said we tried. And he thought that post the election, the people of Freeport, the leaders of Freeport would understand. But you remember in Freeport, and this was triggered also because a letter was sent to Salendon. A letter that came from a prominent lawyer who sought to get residents in Freeport for a case. And the difficulty was he could not get residents when they saw that he was black, although his name sounded white. And eventually he wrote Salendon. So Lyndon came and gave a speech that now is known as Bend or Break. So Lyndon told them at the time, he said, whenever you're considering development, yes, there's economic development, but economic development must take into account the human and social needs of the area in which they're causing for that development. And he said, in Freeport, you don't seem to have a soul because you're not thinking about 
the human needs of the people. He said men are more important than things, and men are more important than machines. Those were his words. And he said that because he said if you don't break it, it will be broken. He was not going to allow it to continue because here in Grand Bahama, here in Freeport, you had the supernumerary police force. They weren't a member of the police force. They had their own police force. Supernumerary. The immigration laws were different. They decided who could be here and who couldn't be here. You didn't decide that. You're in a sovereign nation, but that wasn't your call. And so he had to break it to open it up for us. Because we weren't supposed to live in these parts. Let's remember that. We were supposed to live out and remember this. And that's why whenever I speak about my constituency, people don't understand how emotional it is to me. Because people lived at the time in Pine Ridge. And when they took those houses from Pine Ridge on the back of trucks, they took them to Eight Mile Rock. And they set up those communities like Seagrape and Jonestown. They were supposed to be temporary settlements. Not permanent, but they became permanent. And that is why when you look at the growth and development of Freeport, you see the underdevelopment of east and west of Freeport. That's the purpose. That's why. And to this day, it's not been corrected yet. Because you look at here, and you look at there. In fact, when there was a hurricane in 2004 and 5, it was the first time that some representatives powerful people went to those areas because I was able to drag them out there. They didn't go because you weren't supposed to be and when night fall, you know where you're supposed to be. Hmm. They were townships. Now think about it, particularly students. Think about it, townships. Where else do you hear about townships except in South Africa? Hmm. Townships. You weren't supposed to be a part of this. They had more the Maltese who were working at the hotels. That's why, again, I remind you that no matter how far we've come as a people, we must always return to our roots. Understand what we are, because when we drop the ball any time, trust me, you hear Minister Mitchell talk about immigration, you know why? Because he senses that there's some effort being made all the time to bring in more, because yet at the end of the day, People would prefer their own as opposed to some of us. How many times have you heard, we don't have, Bahamians aren't qualified. Hmm. Bahamians don't have the ability. Well, that's foolishness. But we do contribute to it. Because when we're at our schools and we are allowing ourselves to finish with low grades because we don't want to take the time to work, we're contributing to that. That's why young men in particular They'd like to push them aside and say, well, they have no use. But we have to stand up, and we have to influence, and that's why the cause, this campaign of a cause that we must always be on, to talk to our people, to always say, let's celebrate, but let's stay focused. Let's celebrate, but let's stay focused. And then we've got to call on our God. There's no doubt in my mind that when the Constitution was being written and the preamble was being put on paper, if you look at it, and when you go home tonight and analyze it, you'll see the mention of spirituality of God or something religious at least six times. At least six times. That's the preamble of your Constitution. You check your national anthem. What are those last words? May the road you trod lead where? God. To your God. If you look at your Jan, July 10th, it tells you it's a day of atonement. We're supposed to every year on July 10th stop, analyze where we are, assess what we've done, return to who we are. And then when you get to the 40th anniversary, go claim your land. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So it tells you how deep they were in the word. They understood what they were doing. This was no fluke, no mistake. They were planning, they were working. So Lyndon Penley loved this country. 
when I held his hand the day he was dying, it was a sad day in my life. Because two days before that, he gave me a little note. He told me, he wants you to read that, and when you come back, let's have a chat, because I was coming to Freeport. And when I called Obi, his son, I said, Obi, can I speak to your father? He said, he can't come to the phone. I said, um, okay, um, tell him to call me back. He said, you don't understand. I said, what happened? He said, I think you should come here. I went there. Very sad. Because here it was. I was looking at this man. I took the note out and I read it again. <laughs> Believe it or not, it was the first time I began to understand what he was trying to tell me. So Lyndon loved this country. And everything he sought to do was to build for generations yet unborn. It wasn't about him because he suffered bitterly. He heard negative said about him. In fact, one day when he appeared before the Commission of Inquiry, he said, I'm just hoping that all that's being said about me today, that my grandchildren who are two or three years old would one day be able to analyze its truth and its merit and be able to see me for the man that I was. But he served this country well. He loved this country. And each one of us, we have a responsibility. So Linda never said you have to be PLP, you know. Don't forget his speech. When he said, step now, he said, step now, the country's brightest sons and daughters. He didn't say white. He didn't say black. He didn't say PLP. He didn't say FNM. He said, the country's brightest sons and daughters. Because he always do, there's an election day. But if you work hard enough, you're going to be returned. So you don't have to worry about that. But when that day is over, come together as a people, unite as a people, and build this country. And when we think about the words of our national anthem, we must remember, through love and unity, we must build, we must climb to that common, loftier goal. A loftier goal means for all of us. It's what we all want to do as a people. When we sang the Negro spiritual, the Negro anthem, many don't know that it was between that, this anthem here, and our present national anthem, it came down to decide which one of those would be our national anthem. Some thought well, it should be that, because of the Bahamian, and some thought Timothy Gibson had the best. Timothy gets him one out. But if you read the words of the Black Spiritual Anthem, you'd be surprised. It talks about the land. It talks about everything about independence, about the fight. And so it tells you that they too were thinking on the same accord. But our national anthem speaks to lifting up your head to the rising sun. In other words, let's walk proudly. March on to glory. What is glory? Your bright banners waving high. All our banners, everything we believe in. See how the world marks the manner of our bearing. In other words, when they're looking at the Bahamas on the Olympic track, or they're listening to me somewhere, or some other Bahamian somewhere, see how the world marks the manner of your bearing. Pledge to excel to love and unity. To love and unity, pledge. In other words, go before God. Go before man. Tell man, listen, let's work together. Pledge. Not just say it. Pledge and love and unity. Marching on with march together. That's what we're supposed to do. To a common, loftier goal. Steady, sunward. Though the weather. You know why? Because the weather does get bad. It gets rough. It gets tough. But in spite of all of that, you're supposed to rise up till the road you trod is unto your God. In other words, you are supposed to work together, live together, fight together, go through the rough times together until we get to our maker. And then we all would then celebrate, march on, Bahamas. Yeah. Thank you very much. This land is mine. God gave this land to me, this brave and ancient land to me.
Be strong. 